Emerging Science is a Vermont Public Television production in partnership with and funded by Vermont NSF EPSCOR. EPSCOR, supporting science and engineering at Vermont colleges and businesses and encouraging young Vermonters to seek careers in science. I have a Facebook account, a Twitter account. MySpace. I'm the kind of person who just gets these thoughts sometimes and I just sort of post them, you know. A decade or so ago, no one was making these claims simply because there was none of this or this, hardly any of this, and just a slow, primitive version of this. It hasn't taken long for us to become a society consumed by social media and the technology that supports it for better and for worse. It's become part of my daily life and it's actually changed my life. I almost lost my iPhone and then I finally got it back and I was, it was like a girlfriend. I'm kind of, oh, I'm so glad to see you, kind of, I missed you. It's now our way of life, a mark we're making, quite literally, on society. Every message, every click, leaving a fingerprint in cyberspace. Data is never truly deleted. It's just a state on the disk. So what are the risks and rewards of a life online? And what can we learn from ourselves, a population suddenly exposed? It's expanding the ways in which we gather information about each other. We're simply watching how people behave uh, in an open setting. In this episode of Emerging Science, a look inside the cyber world we now call home and some of the work Vermont scientists are doing to make sense of it all. First, some perspective. Fact, social media are exploding. Between 2005 and 2011, the number of adult internet users involved in social networking jumped from 8% to 65%, according to a Pew Internet Research study. Even the Pope, at 84 years old, now has a Twitter account. It's just so huge, and it's having such a big effect on our society and, and the way we get information. More than 90% of the social media population is on Facebook. Only seven years old, it was initially launched as a college site, a natural fit for a generation that grew up surrounded by technology. I remember, I think it was third grade when we got instant messaging accounts. I didn't really touch a computer until I got to college. Today, Facebook boasts more than half a billion users worldwide. Everybody uses Facebook. Facebook is only going to uh, get stronger and grow more across generations as well. Between Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, and countless other sites, two-thirds of Americans now use social media. The youngest generations, in their teens and 20s, still make up the largest group of users. But the fastest growth has been among the middle-aged and older population, including those you'd least expect to find online, seniors eager to strengthen connections with friends and family. A lot of people from the older generation are becoming so involved with social media that it maybe also closes the gap. I have grandparents on Facebook and my mom's on Facebook and Chris is on Facebook. So it's not, it's not like social media is for the young people. It's part of everybody's life at this point. It's not going away. Sorry. <laughs> Nicole Ravlin is a social media junkie by trade. As co-founder of PMG, or People Making Good, a public relations firm in Burlington, Vermont. These online tools not only allow her to reach, but to read consumers. I am sold on social media. You're having more access to more people in various ways. One of the most visible ways in which social media is playing out is in the commercial market, where our behavior and interests are a prime and exploitable commodity. Now people are coming to us saying, we need to have this as part of our marketing mix and how can we get there? You know, people can save money by clipping coupons onto their card. Yep. And that's the viral aspect of right. it, is once they clip it, it's on their wall. Everyone can view that. Yeah. PMG clients such as MyWebGrocer.com rely on the viral nature of social media. What used to look like this. It was so good, I told two friends about it. And they told two friends. 
and so on, and so on, and so on. Now looks like this. Consumers hooking other consumers on products and services by online word of mouth. People used to look at celebrities or, or uh, influencers and hoping that they would have that trickle-down effect. Now influencers are people, you know, like you and me. You know, we have our own social influencer. Even if I don't know them, but I see a review on a product, that's more valuable to me than if someone is just advertising to me. Here, social media is not just a helpful tool. It allows marketers to get inside our minds without us even knowing. You can see from Twitter and what people are talking about on Twitter and what's trending from day to day or week to week. It's how we follow news trends for our clients. Now we have this portal, if you like, into other aspects of human behavior. And so one of it is emotion, which is very, it's a, an amazing thing to be able to measure. While the masses are busy blogging and tweeting, chatting and posting, scientists are watching them do it. In the mathematics department at the University of Vermont, Chris Danforth and Peter Dodds are buried in social media, hoping to gain insight into the collective behavior of humans. What social media has enabled is a way to collect data at a scale that enables social scientists, psychologists, and anthropologists to learn about how people are behaving. If we can follow in detail how people behave, we can start to appreciate large groups of people, understand how societies function, how to hopefully make them better, uh, where things go wrong. The anthropologists love this stuff, right? Right? I mean, this is exactly the study of people and society and uh, what makes us tick and who we are. From, that must be August and that must be September. Associate and assistant professors Dodds and Danforth are leading a number of studies focusing on social media. What we're doing here is collecting expressions that people make on Twitter and on blogs, looking at patterns in the way people are behaving as a function of where they live, uh, what time of day it is, um, what's going on in the world. Twitter, the social networking and microblogging website that relies on instant messaging, is one of their main sources of data. We've kind of talked to Twitter about setting up a, a pipeline from their servers to ours, and, and so we get roughly 10,000 tweets every minute, a random selection of them, and that ends up being about 10 million a day. Each tweet, of up to 140 characters, is a window into the mind of the populace. So each of these hard drives has roughly a billion messages on it. Each of these blocks that you see is a separate tweet. So now we can get more of a, a gauge on, on, um, on how we behave collectively, because we really have no idea of you know, what 10,000 people, 100,000 people, I mean, as individuals, it's very hard for us to understand those numbers. Um, they're often turned into statistics in some way that we don't appreciate. With the help of their small team of students, including Isabel Kluman and Cameron Harris, Dodds and Danforth are mining the data looking for trends, such as frequently used words denoting happiness or sadness. The up arrow is sick, hate, stupid, sad, depressed, bored, lonely, alone. Mad. They have enough data to chart some of their findings. This is the time series as a function of day over the last two and a half years of happiness on Twitter. This graph compares the overall mood on Twitter over a set period of time. You see some days pop out um, as being happier, so holidays typically are happier days. Saturday and Sunday are typically happier days. On Saturday, people are, are using the words love and party and fun and happy more often than Tuesdays. Some of the results are intuitive, including that happiness spikes or dips during major events. Shocking news from Los Angeles tonight. Which tend to trigger an outpouring of emotion. Star Michael Jackson is dead at the age of 50. So, on Michael Jackson's death back in 2009, we see that was one of the, the biggest system wide changes. One of the most positive days we saw in blogs was the election of Barack Obama in 2008. Yes, we can. It was the day that deviated most from its monthly yes, average. We can. They found, too, that online negativity breeds more negativity. People have a tendency to uh, reciprocate negative emotions more than positive ones. But they've discovered an overall positivity in our words. There's a bias in language. We've looked at the New York Times, Twitter, books from over hundreds of years, and music lyrics, and they all have this positive bias. There are certainly very negative words that, that are important for us to communicate to each other. 
uh, and, and then this, but the, the, the shift is towards positivity. So it's, it's just a really nice reflection of the sociality of people. Another finding, that age is a factor in mood. The UVM team has been able to chart happiness, which visibly increases as users get older. That is, until about age 60. One of the things we found was that um, teenagers are really quite upset with their lot in life, and so they use words in these blogs that can be very sad and negative. So the, the happiness of, of people in the beginning of their life was, was low, and then it, it sort of came up and peaked in, in the midlife between 50 and 60, uh, and then kind of fell off. We're not asking them questions. This is simply how the tone of their writings appear uh, between, say, 45 and 60 seems to be a maximum. By analyzing online posts, the researchers are able to observe what never before was possible and do it in real time. Conversations that used to take place in an environment where there were no, there were no devices to measure how people were behaving, those conversations are now taking place on the Internet and on Twitter and on Facebook. And, uh, and so in, in some sense, they're, we're able to look at, at, at what people are doing. And their work is made easier by the online population's eagerness to share like never before. There's a, a slow cultural change um, of people being more willing to um, exhibit things that would have been private. Of course, with this new public exhibition come new rewards and risks. People forget that once it's out there, you never can take it back. They don't realize Facebook, anything you put there, in my opinion, is forever. Law enforcement can quickly put the risks into sobering perspective. Jonathan Rajewski is co-director of the Champlain College Center for Digital Investigation. He also works with local and state police, including Detective Trooper Renee Hall, who rely on his training in digital forensics for more and more of their investigations. I like to break the word down. So digital is anything that can read, transmit, or store digital information. And that's a wide variety of devices. It could be a television at home, computers, laptops, phones. Forensics is using a scientific process in pursuit of presenting that evidence at court. In the field. So this is a field deployable um, forensic machine. He is equipped with a number of devices capable of gathering digital evidence. Criminal investigations were typically scoped into a very strict search warrant. Like we're only allowed to search for certain types of files. Using this application, we can do that without violating privacy. This will allow us typically to bypass certain passwords or security permissions that are on the system and allows us to just look for exactly what we're targeted to look for. So this is a cell phone forensic device. And essentially what this is going to do is extract data from that phone and put it onto this thumb drive. You know, what it's doing now is initializing. With a couple clicks of this device, I can dump the call records, the photos, the video, and deleted data as well. Um, contacts, all that information, um, relatively simple. The vast majority of criminal and civil cases now include a digital component. Most of the crimes now have either a computer or a cell phone or something involved. Those components need to be processed just like the bloody knife or the smoking gun on the floor. Whether it be email, an iPad or an iPhone involving music and usually even with those types of devices we can start to build a timeline to determine when certain things happened. One of the more recent examples of cyber forensics a 2010 murder in Burlington. Police found the victim, Kathleen Smith, in her home. They found the suspect, Jose Pazos, in the woods an hour away. In his possession, a knife and a laptop computer containing incriminating Google searches. Combined, the physical and digital evidence provided police with what they needed to make an arrest. Typically, the digital component is, in my opinion, the icing on the cake. It solidifies, it um, confirms or disputes what the investigators found during their investigation. And usually the digital component is very definitive, like it is there or it's not there, or some piece of evidence was on the device or it wasn't. And to pull out the hard drive. Inside this lab at the Burlington Police Department, a growing number of investigators comb through digital evidence. This is where all the information is. Deconstructing electronic devices 
and accessing data. We take the evidence in. If it's a computer, we take the hard drive out. Um, we hook it up to our computers and we use a device that stops us from changing any of the evidence. During any daily activities, people aren't thinking about that and we can exploit that on the forensic standpoint to try to determine what happened. So whether it be a GPS device in your car, you type in an address and you make a trip. Well, you don't necessarily think about, well, the GPS remembers everywhere you went. Uh, the phone remembers maybe where you were or what phone calls you made, or the computer will remember what Google searches you ran. People are demanding features. They're demanding convenience. And in doing that, all those features people love are being stored somewhere in some way, shape, or form. And someone can look that up with the proper authority and use it in an investigation. The challenge and the thrill of the job, Rajewski says, is keeping up with the ever-evolving technology. You always need to be glued to the, to the media, to the news, to the researchers to try to determine um, what's happening, what technology is coming out. Um, it's not uncommon for a new piece of technology to come across our desk during an investigation and we have to quickly try to research it to figure out how to extract data from it. Staying current is a necessity for Rajewski, as it is for marketing students at Champlain College looking to break into the business world. Then there's the online space that's going to help create the opportunities and the connections. Where the focus in Professor Elaine Young's class used to be on ad campaigns. Hey, where's the thief? I don't think there's anybody back there. It now is shifting toward social media. The current set of tools that we talk about and as we label them social media just are pathways that allow us to communicate faster and easier than we could have before and give us access to data and information much easier than we could have before. When you look at five years ago, how people were interacting on Facebook now, that businesses have pages, they're interacting with customers, they're acquiring customers from social media, uh, it's, it's completely a big piece of the marketing mix now that you have to consider when you're budgeting. It's the gateway or the entry point to creating a relationship, whatever that relationship is going to be, whether it's a personal relationship or a professional relationship. Young says the root of the social media boom is not technology, but a basic human need to connect. At, at the end of the day, humans like to interact. So the social tools allow us to interact in greater ways, but it's no different than me inviting my neighbor to come sit on the porch and have a beer with me at the end of the day. We're socially connecting, but human nature hasn't really changed. That desire for that social interaction is what's driving the growth in the tools. Throughout history, humans have searched for new and better ways to communicate. <laughs> letters, smoke signals, uh, drums. Uh, there's always been a need to communicate in some way and create opportunities for social gatherings and connection. From prehistoric cave paintings to primitive postal services, to the printing press, typewriter, telegraph, and telephone. Mr. Watson, come here, I want you. All have revolutionized the way we share information. In the past few decades, there has been a dramatic growth in telecommunications. The past few years, a seismic shift, thanks in large part to social media. The more you say, well, if we created a space online where people could come together and share their pictures, so suddenly you have Flickr. And wow, wouldn't it be great if they could do that with video? Well, then you have YouTube. And then you have this birth of this space where anybody can create a video because everybody has video on their phones or they can get a flip camera and then they can be the next Justin Bieber. And then everybody's got that intrinsic reward of I can get people to see what I've done. There's definitely a, a, you know, a change in the range of things. So Facebook and Twitter and of course the web, you can distribute to so many more people. Just as anthropologists pore over ancient artifacts for clues as to who we were, scientists now dissect social media, hoping to uncover who we are. It's just been a, a, a really interesting time to start looking at how people behave, and it's, it's almost unavoidable. One, one is very attracted to all the data that's appearing um, online. Which brings us back to the work of Chris Danforth and Peter Dodds. This knowledge is out there, this data is out there about how we behave, how we move around, the choices we make. We have to look at it. It's, it's sort of the age of, of studying social phenomena. It's a self-knowledge. It's a collective self-knowledge. Having access to that knowledge holds appeal, 
some would say dangerous appeal, to many in the business world and beyond, in areas where popular opinion and trends affect outcomes. Some suggestions that stock market behavior can be predicted by mood and Twitter, but it's pretty tentative at the moment. Um, uh, elections, maybe, maybe, we'll see. Many credit former Vermont governor and 2004 presidential candidate Howard Dean with pioneering internet-based campaigning and fundraising. Today I announce that I am running for the presidency of the United States of America. Which presidential candidate will make a permanent or long-term military commitment to the people of Iraq? Thank you, Senator Thompson. Social media had taken strong hold by the 2008 race. And by the 2010 midterm elections, nearly a quarter of adults online used social media to connect to the campaign or election. We'll have a big election next year, um, and, and, and Twitter will be much more popular, right? it's growing enormously, uh, so, so we'll have more data on that. Dodds and Danforth will be watching with vested interest, seeing what trends emerge, but shying away from using their findings in a predictive manner. And what we're trying to do is understand how people are behaving and you know, leave the predictions and the ramifications to the policymakers. We can't currently use social media to predict the future. There are some um, attempts to do so. Their main goal is to develop ways to better measure our well-being and use that tool to our benefit. We're coming up with this hedonometer, a way to measure the, the well-being or the happiness of a population using social media that, you know, that could in, in, inform people who are making decisions about um, which social programs to run or um, you know, things like that, that, that they, would, you know, they would use that to, as another dial on their gauge, you know, as opposed to GDP being the, the main driver all the time. Imagine if you could actually measure this like, like one can measure the temperature. What we have is not as good as a, as a thermometer yet, but we're opening up this kind of measurement of human behavior and it's just a very natural thing to do, it's an important thing to do. Part of what we're doing is bringing a number in that is some kind of uh, gauge, if you like, of happiness, putting it next to other numbers. Here we are, this is this country is this happy, this country is this happy, this one is performing well or not well, and we can start to make decisions about how we want to change things. We're not in the top, that's for sure. We're kind of towards the middle of the, of the bunch. We're happier than a lot of the very poor countries. Whether social media and technology have affected our overall well-being so far is a matter of opinion. I think it's a great thing. I love technology. It's kind of this addictive thing, right? And you check it too much, and I have to like force myself to just no. I when I need to get stuff done, I can't be on there. It all comes down to uh, what needs does it fulfill for me. Uh, regardless of age, there are certain needs that social tools will provide and will take care of for you. It has impacted people's relationships for better or for worse. Um, and how it has really changed the way that we interact with each other. People sit down to dinner together and go to exchange information and many times there's not a whole heck of a lot to say because I already know what's going on with you. I saw it on Facebook. I guess from my perspective, distraction, losing two or three hours, just <laughs> uh, staring at a computer and not really being very engaged in what they're doing. Does it replace face-to-face? -face? No. I say social media and all of these tools enhances it. I think it's net positive. I mean, we'll see, but uh, I'm an optimist, so I would have to say I would, I would hope it's net positive, but it's hard not to see the, the negative effects and, and all of that. I think there could be a danger, um, especially with the amount of social media that's out there. Some people just put maybe private things out on the internet that they shouldn't. People will criticize Twitter and Facebook a lot, for, for especially Twitter. Like there are all these little bite-sized pieces of information. I actually think that more people are reading and writing than almost ever before and 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 that that's that that's actually a great thing change especially change as sudden as the explosion of social media is bound to create some waves I can imagine there's going to be uh, considerable backlash in generations to come against being wired all the time it's to be expected as society settles into its new cyber skin if we went back in time, would we say letters are bad, you know, the mail is bad, the telegraph is bad? Because the telegraph actually was basically very much like Twitter, right? You would send very short pieces. I'm sure people sent obnoxious things to each other, things that were upsetting, or, or I just ate rhubarb, stop. It, it is <laughs> delicious this time of year in Vermont, stop. The advent of language itself, right? It brought in all sorts of good and bad things, but 
we wouldn't get rid of it.